Even as world leaders descended upon New Delhi today for the 18th G20 Leader Summit, there was one man whose arrival was awaited with bated breath. US President Joe Biden landed in India around 6.55 p.m. this evening and went straight to 7 LKM, the Prime Minister's residence, to hold a bilateral meeting with him. Now, as soon as Air Force One touched down, the President was welcomed by MOS for Civil Aviation, General V.K. Singh and a cultural performance. And before heading to meet Prime Minister Narendra Modi, President Joe Biden held a quick briefing too with his National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan at the airport itself, visuals of which were seen from the airport. Now on the expected agenda of this crucial bilateral meet were several issues that were taken up when the two leaders met last in the United States during Prime Minister Narendra Modi's state visit. And today's meeting is being seen as a follow-up of that. Now remember, this is President Biden's first visit to India and his second meeting with Prime Minister Modi in just under three months. Clearly, the two leaders warned that the momentum which was seen during PM Modi's state visit and before that continues even now. Now the F-414 jet engines, Predator drones, 6G, ease of visas and a breakthrough on the civil nuclear agreement. All these have been deals that need removal of roadblocks. Did that happen today? Well, yes, there is a joint statement that has been released just a few minutes ago. Details of which we will tell you right now on Beyond the Headline. But uh, remember, this crucial meet also comes at a time when the Russia-Ukraine war is happening. And amid all of this, there are a lot of points that were discussed between Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and American President Joe Biden. Now, why does the India-US partnership matter in the 21st century? What does India stand to gain from this relationship? And how can India move smoothly through the push and pull of the pressures of the Russia-Ukraine war? I take this to my guests tonight. I'm joined by Mr. Suresh Goyal, former ambassador. Gurujit Singh, former ambassador, also joins me. And former secretary general of the SARC, Sheel Khan Sharmaji, also joins us. Good evening, gentlemen. Welcome to Mirror Now on a very, very important day and a crucial meeting on a day that, uh, you know, a very crucial meeting took place. It concluded a short while back. And in fact, a joint statement has now been released a few minutes back uh, on this. But uh, before coming to that, let me just quickly, uh, you know, talk to you, former Ambassador uh, Suresh Goyalji. Ambassador Goyal, um, you know, this meeting is being seen as a follow-up of Prime Minister Modi's state visit a few months back. Uh, to the United States, and it is also being seen as uh, Prime Minister Modi and India trying to reciprocate the kind of hospitality and warmth that the Bidens had uh, uh, shared with Prime Minister Modi, had extended to Prime Minister Modi back then. Now, we have the joint statement, uh, but first, before getting into that, help us understand why this relationship, the, the ties between India and the United States are important in the times that we are living in. Thank you very much. Good evening. And before I go on further, let me say hello to my neighbors, Gurjeet and Shilkan Sharma. Good to see you here. I don't, I don't often get to see them where I live. So thank you very much for making that possible. Now, coming to the statement, coming to the visit, uh, you said that whether this is actually reciprocating the state visit of Prime Minister Modi to the USA, in many ways, yes, in terms of protocol, there could be an element of reciprocating the hospitality, the, the treatment, the lavish treatment given to him when he had visited Washington. Uh, I think, though, I would look at the visit more in terms of substance rather than just protocol and the kind of warmth of gestures, which we very often uh, try to use to describe how successful or how warm the visit has been. Uh, first of all, I think this visit of Prime, uh, President Biden to India, of course, G20 is the context. But the, I think it is more a kind of a strategic, uh, strategic uh, 
calculation, strategic uh, act, act really, because when President Biden comes to India, and in that context, he talks about how disappointed he is that Xi Jinping is not coming to the G20 meeting, which is a very valid kind of a thing. But clearly, it indicates what his thought processes had been or what he had been actually prioritizing on before he came to India for the G20 visit. Of course, it was combined with also a bilateral visit where the expectation was to discuss several things discussed uh, when uh, Prime Minister Modi was in uh, Washington. But I think even in terms of the bilateral context, the focus was more on the strategic environment, geostrategic environment in our region, where one factor is giving continuous and greater and greater concern, uh, worries to the USA and of course to us also. And I think we are all referring to, I at least I'm referring to yeah. the dragon in the, in the China shop here, which has been actually asserting itself increasingly. And, and yeah, and you know, in, Ambassador, yeah, that's exactly what interesting point there. And, uh, you know, of course, we know uh, the elephant in the room or rather the dragon in the room is, uh, uh, you know, whose leader is not present, China, we are talking about. Mm -hmm. And I have the joint statement with me, which has been released just a few minutes ago, in which strategic partnership, the India, uh, India and the US sharing that comprehensive strategic partnership is mm -hmm. at the fore because this says, um, you know, again, the, both the leaders reaffirm the importance of the Quad in supporting a free, open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific. And uh, Prime Minister Modi looked forward to welcoming President Biden to the next Quad Leader Summit to be hosted in India in 2024. Mm -hmm. So clearly a reiteration of what both the leaders, both the countries have been saying at Global Fora. Uh, the insistence hmm. on uh, free, open and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Ambassador Gurjeet Singh uh, clearly pointing towards the rising Chinese aggression and also pointing to the fact that uh, anybody who tries to unilaterally change the status quo uh, has to deal with the kind of partnerships that this region is seeing and, you know, maintain that uh, inclusivity and stability in the Indo-Pacific region. Happy to be with you. So to answer your question, yes and no. Yes, President Gurjeet, Biden I is in you... India. I can tell you, if he had not come, the impact would have been far different than the absence of Putin or Xi. So therefore, the presence of Biden is critical to India's coming out party, India's emergence as a big power. Second, there are three aspects to Biden's visit. The bilateral with India, which happened today, and which is extremely important, the G20 itself, and of course, bi Biden's bilaterals with others, where the one with China is missing. But what is not there? There is no quad beating on the sidelines. And I was in Jakarta last week. There was no Biden in Jakarta at the East Asia Summit. It was Vice President Harris. So when you say this great commitment to the Indo-Pacific, you know, it is partial, it is selective. It is not there all the time, but yes, it is with us. So I think we should look at what India and the US can do together and wherever our interests meet in the Indo-Pacific and elsewhere, we should act. I am waiting to see whether President Biden will announce a counteraction to the BRI by new connectivity projects in Asia and the indo pacific hmm, hmm. Interesting points there. Uh, Ambassador Sharma, um, you know, yes, the focus is on the relationship between India and China, uh, India and United States. Yes, uh, the strategic partner needs to be, the partnership needs to be strengthened and taken forward in this uh, time, especially when we are seeing evolving geopolitics around the world. Uh, and one of the things where 
uh, you know, Ambassador Gujit doesn't want to talk about China, but one of the things uh, that is also interesting and comes again and again into play is the fact that uh, the global supply chains uh, and the semiconductor manufacturing industry was hugely affected during the post, uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic time. And the joint statement talks about how the leaders reiterated, and I'm quoting from the joint statement, reiterated their support for building resilient global semiconductor supply chains, noting in this respect a multi-year initiative of microchip technology to invest approximately 300 million US dollars in expanding its research. Uh, and development in India and advanced micro devices announcement to invest $400 million in India over the next five years to expand research and development uh, and engineering operations in India. So clearly, the world has realized the fact that global supply chains and the semiconductor industry needs to be strengthened outside of China and therefore uh, also present a sort of, uh, you know, counter to uh, what China has been doing in these past one and a half, two years? Yes, this, uh, this, this part of this joint statement actually is a reaffirmation of the commitment which was made in the joint statement in June, June uh, last, when PM was in Washington. And uh, this emphasis on these two, uh, exp two uh, you know, uh, $300 million and $400 million for the research and development and, uh, uh, you know, uh, present... Uh, production chain of the uh, semiconductors and the companies involved is actually action. Uh, you know, it is action-oriented, as uh, our PM has been uh, repeatedly emphasizing. So this is one very good uh, takeaway. But I'd like to say something in a general sense. You know, the PM has, in his tweet, said there's a bond between India and U.S. Now, this bonding is there very manifest in the optics of the, of the meeting. And I would say that I have not seen such unreserved bonding uh, uh, with India, you know, with other countries, uh, you know, it's uh, so what U.S. actually uh, does with India and how U.S. treats India is very manifest in this in this visit and the agreement like June they met in Washington. Now they meet in Delhi and again they agreed to meet uh, uh, in 2024 in a court uh, in a court summit summit in, in, in India. So this shows uh, frequent meetings at the highest level and connecting with the previous meeting so that uh, there is a certain uh, you know, work, work in progress which they keep looking at and pushing forward. This is something which is uh, very, very propitious for the relationship between India and US. It's the bilateral content is actually very much uh, uh, rewarding in that sense. Now, as for the G20, the, the U.S. statement that they yeah. would like India to succeed, uh, India's presidency to succeed in G20, itself is, is a very big uh, marker because they, they are committed to, to success of the G20. We have to see how the, this uh, happens on Sunday. If we are able to get a joint statement, uh, you know, a, a leader's declaration, that will be a clear success. And uh, we have to see how it works out. But uh, the, the support of the U.S. for India's leadership of G20 is also another marker. And the third thing about China, I cannot uh, uh, ignore it. Uh, the thing is that uh, Chinese, apparently, they felt shy of coming to this meeting because there are so many Western leaders who had already agreed to come, and they were coming to support the GS, uh, G20 presidency. And Chinese, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're hubris, and their uh, condescension to India would, would be out of place here. So uh, Xi Jinping didn't come. I think it is his own problems, it is his own complex. And uh, that he didn't come, that's his, as uh, our foreign minister said, our external affairs minister said, that's their problem if they are not coming. But uh, we yeah. see how... I think, how I think it's uh, interesting how you put it that the Chinese are shy in coming to India. Perhaps, uh, you know, you're the first person who's saying they're shy because uh, all along we've been talking about how this might be just a pre-planned strategy by China uh, to undermine G20, uh, India's G20 presidency. Uh, but coming to you, Ambassador Suresh Goyal, um, you know, something that was being talked about that could be on agenda on this uh, in this meeting uh, was the defense partnership specifically to the 
F414 jet engines, which will uh, be eventually manufactured in India and therefore help the Indian Air Force. And the joint statement suggests that the leaders welcome the completion of the congressional notification process on the 29th of August this year and the commencement of negotiations for a commercial agreement between General Electric Aerospace and HAL to manufacture GE414 jet engines. Uh, we know that India and the United States already share a comprehensive strategic partnership. Defense ties between the two countries have strengthened year on year. Uh, we have joint military exercises with the United States. Clearly, the two countries want to take this forward specifically in the kind of times that we are living in, in the kind of times where Russia and China have come uh, together to present a bloc and the United States and other allies uh, are also trying to counter that bloc. Uh, Shreya, uh, let me put it this way. I would be very, very reluctant to really uh, compartmentalize our relations with USA in good bilateral, bad bilateral, good this and bad this. Every relationship has both the sides. And they progress depending upon what the interest of either side is. And sometimes there are compromises. In fact, very often there are compromises made. And sometimes there are many reasons to really be happy with what we get out to achieve. Taking an example of these jet engines. Now, uh, there is clearly a great deal of willingness on part of the USA to clear the way for technology to be transferred from private industry in the USA on these engines to India. But that is where the crunch lies. The crunch lies really in terms of the private industry, the private sector in the USA, giving the technology to, you, uh, to India and not just giving the technology but actually doing the transfer in a way that we can use it effectively. Transfer of technology is not simply a game of really giving a few uh, sheets, uh, bug sheets here, the drawings, and et cetera, et cetera. Every technology transfer requires hand-holding. Every technology transfer requires working together with the teams, supporting the other team. I, would, I am hoping that this will happen because if it happens, really, that will indicate two things. First of all, that uh, we would be actually getting a real transfer of technology from the USA. And number two, that more than the government, the private sector will be engaging with India. And I will be very keen to see this simply because indications as far as the private sector from the USA is concerned, they tend, tend to go where the supply chains are more effective. China to Vietnam, uh, they, there are clear indications that they uh, will be happy to go to Vietnam because Vietnam can supplant those supply chains much more effectively. So I think we need to work on that relationship much more and much more strongly. And the good thing is that the USA as a government is willing to do that. The second thing really is, uh, sometimes I really think that China brought us closer. Can China also create the drift? If USA and China are able to restore their commercial, commerce and economic relationship to what they were even five years ago before the pandemic began, would that bring a distance between India and the USA? I don't know. But I need to think about all these factors before I can make my own assessment. Shreya. Yeah. You, you know, what's also interesting, ambassadors, is the fact that uh, China's presence, the presence of the Chinese president wouldn't have made for so much discussion as it has <laughs> made for uh, when he's absent from the G20 summit and we're all discussing about it. But Ambassador mm -hmm. Gurjeet Singh, you know, for India, it's been a tricky journey. It's been a tricky journey uh, when the Russia-Ukraine war started and we knew that we have good ties with the United States as well as Russia. And therefore, uh, we have, in fact, managed to maintain that balance, managed to maintain and sustain the good relationship, the close relationship with the United States as well as maintain um, a healthy relationship with Russia as well as a decent relationship with Ukraine. Uh, but in terms of, uh, you know, our defense ties uh, in the ever-evolving geopolitical situation and the kind of, as I said, 
uh, the uh, blocks being created. We are talking about, um, you know, one, one earth, one family coming together and uh, borders getting closer, borders getting reduced. But clearly, uh, there are blocks that are not being overtly talked about. They are being made. And in this situation, how does India really pave her way through all of this and maintain a good relationship with the United States? at a time when the U.S. is trying to get its allies closer and closer to counter the Russia-China bloc? The way to get across this is with a hop, step and a jump and nimble-footedness, because that is what Indian diplomacy is exhibiting right now. So we are free of ideology. We don't use the term non-alignment. We use the word strategic autonomy which means for an every action, every issue, we take an independent view. We are with the United States in the Indo-Pacific. It does not mean we are with them everywhere. My colleagues have pointed out the advantages of being with the United States, but there is no trade advantage. That is one big problem. The trade concessions don't come. You quoted from the joint statement today, in which you talk about specific supply lines. And I'm very happy that now we are talking of semiconductors and microchips. But if you take the totality of value uh, chains, all the quad countries trade with China has increased in 2022 and not diminished. So this, this is contradictory. None of us can do without China. The reason I earlier indicated that we could perhaps ignore China is because I believe that this G20 is about us, India, and the global South, and this constant harping on China's presence or absence or Biden coming in takes away value from that. That is my concern, that we need to go back to the basics, and our leadership comes out of the fact that we champion the global South, in which the United States is a friend of India, but we want it to become a bigger friend of the global South. All promises that the G7 countries make, as do China for that matter, must be fulfilled. We don't want empty promises for the global South anymore. And as for friendship, we would have had a proper leader statement if our G7 friends had not been insistent on dragging the Ukraine crisis into the G20. That is the problem. We all tend to blame the Russians and the Chinese, but what about where it starts from? So I think India is in a hard place because yeah. of our friends on all sides. We need to soften that blow by taking our own nimble-footed line, which is a champion of the global south. Thank you. Hmm. And, and uh, you know, um, this, this whole... Um, the fact that uh, the G7 members, countries from the Europe and the West, they're trying to bring in the Russia-Ukraine war agenda into the G20 is very reflective as soon as the leaders started coming into New Delhi uh, and they started speaking with the media. Uh, for instance, the UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, he talked about uh, Russia's uh, attack on Ukraine and how it has, you know, affected food security and food prices across the world and so on and so forth. So clearly, uh, you know, countries across the world, specifically the West, the European countries, are trying to bring in that agenda. But Ambassador Sharma, how will India be able to then put forth and push forward the voice and the priorities of the Global South? We've been trying to do that under our G20 presidency, but now that we have the leader summit finally happening over the weekend, how does how can India really put forth the priorities of the global south and become the voice of the global south? Uh, you know, this uh, this evening itself, uh, there was a press conference by the uh, Sherpa uh, and uh, the foreign secretary, and the uh, Sherpa yeah. said that uh, uh, he, he expressed certain optimism about a joint, uh, joint uh, declaration, a daily declaration. Yeah. I think that optimism uh, probably rests on the fact that these, these uh, issues about Global South, on which uh, there is no problem, uh, are, are getting support. And uh, so it is that which is going to push, because G20, after all, 
is a forum which was created for issues which are germane to the global south. That issue which has come up now, because since, 19, since in 2022, was not part of the G20 agenda in the big, you know, and so this geopolitics has come now. The whole uh, question is how we, uh, we corner that thing of put that geopolitics in its place and manage to move forward on the, uh, on the economic and socioeconomic environment, climate change, all these, uh, these, these issues banking, uh, poverty elevation, food and fuel crisis. All these things are very important for the G20 and for the, the, the South. So I feel that uh, if there is certain uh, measure of confidence in uh, uh, in the Sherpa after their meetings, uh, they've been meeting uh, continuously for the last uh, two, three days. And if there's a certain measure of confidence, Hopefully, uh, we should look forward to Sunday with uh, some uh, cautious optimism. Uh, how they will do this is, a, a, yeah. I, have, uh, I have no idea whether it is a drafting problem or whether it is a pro problem of stances. If, uh, like in Indonesia, the, the problem was solved by a drafting compromise because they just said uh, that they reaffirmed the UN resolutions. Uh, and all they took note of the UN resolutions and left it at that. And uh, at that, this is not an era of war, is a, is a statement acceptable to everyone. So these two things combined and uh, made the Indonesian joint statement, uh, the leader statement, uh, a consensus. Today, uh, what will be the thing? Will there be a drafting uh, solution or whether there'll be a certain uh, compromise among the contending uh, uh, positions? So this is uh, where the uh, matters rest. Yeah. We'll have to wait for the leaders to decide. Uh, okay. And uh, I think one of our very eminent uh, diplomats, Mr. Sibyl, has said that uh, if the G G7, G20 doesn't uh, issue a statement, then it's, uh, it's a failure. And he has strong words. But uh, that is a message, I think, for the uh, countries who are insisting on a certain language uh, and uh, they don't care. Uh, that, that, that such a language might actually wreck the, the whole, uh, whole process. So, uh, hmm. I so, think... So, uh, you know, probably, probably it's the challenge of stances, Ambassador Shilkan Sharma. It's not so much uh, the drafting comes later, but first the stances have to be, uh, you know, simplified and clarified. And clearly that is uh, a challenge in a diverse grouping such as the G20, where you have the developed and the developing countries. But interestingly, of course, the first time it is happening in a developed nation, the G20 Leaders Summit, and India is playing host. Uh, one of the key pointers from the joint statement, Ambassador Suresh Goyal, is on the nuclear suppliers group. And um, the leaders have said that they welcome the intensified consultations between both the sides and the United States reaffirmed its support for India's membership in the nuclear suppliers group and committed to continue engagement with like-minded partners to advance this goal. So this was something that uh, was being talked about, that was expected, that it might come up in this meeting. Uh, and, uh, you know, between India and the U.S., the nuclear energy supplies group is a crucial mm -hmm. point uh, in the partnership, in the strategic partnership that we share. Absolutely, fair. Again, I go back to the history of this particular formulation of encouraging India's membership of the nuclear supplies group and the USA prepared to render all kinds of support. This is not a new thing. And we are grateful that USA has always supported our membership of the nuclear supplies group. Uh, in fact, uh, once the, the, the kind of a reluctance to open up the nuclear structures, agreement structures to India was over. And knowing that India is a benign power uh, without any aggressive designs anywhere at all. And the rest was actually quite, uh, once we signed the one, two, three agreement, the rest was actually proceeding the way we had expected. The real issue in our membership of the suppliers group is China. I mean, is China who doesn't want to, to let India come in. Similarly, in terms of the membership of the Security Council, it is China who is actually, would most likely veto. The G20, again, uh, uh, 
consensus on any formulation regarding Ukraine. Uh, it is basically because there is a, a, I think what you said was quite right, is a difference of stance between two different groups on those issues. Until they're, they're, they're able to clarify their own positions and bring them together, uh, no amount of drafting is going to really be helpful. Uh, I'm speaking the way things are really. Therefore, but at the same time, at the same time, no country in G15, even though the decisions are taken by consensus, would like to see a failure of a G15 without, which will happen if there is no statement. It's simply because they run the risk of the G G20 summits in their countries coming to facing the same suffering the same fate if they don't they go to the extremes. So I'm quite sure that at the end of it there would be a declaration. It could be a declaration devoid of certain critical issues like Black Sea Grain Deal, like uh, Ukraine, uh, and there could be you know uh, uh, more issues like which could actually create differences between the members. But so there would be a kind of a minimum agreement between all the countries. But whether there would be actually any consensus on issues which really address the global problems, debt restructuring. What do we what will we have on the debt restructuring in the in the G20 document? I don't see any, uh, hmm. uh, I mean, any hope. Or climate of crisis. There because... There's always a tussle between the developed and the developing exactly. countries in that as well. Ex exactly. So those will be the critical issues which will demonstrate how far the developed and the developing countries, even really leaving aside China and uh, Russia, how far can they come together? So let us see on that. Shreya, I finish. Hmm. Ambassador Gurjeet, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh, um, you know, we also know that uh, the next year is crucial for President Biden. There is an uh, election that is coming up. How much of this uh, is uh, or can be attributed to back home and domestic politics? And how much of it uh, owes itself to the global geopolitics that it has been playing out in the past one and a half, two years? What? I would just like to disagree with my colleagues. I do not think if there was no common statement by all leaders that the G20 would have failed. I do not believe that. Secondly, in the joint statement, India and US have agreed on several objectives of our G20. They will stand by them. And those are the ones that India is actually looking to pursue. Third, the United States wants to use the G20 to criticize Russia. China wants to use this G20 to embarrass India. So these are not anything conducive to the global south. But now you ask me this question about what will happen in 2024 globally and the impact of the US election. I think there is great concern in the Indo-Pacific. Will a Biden to administration or a successor to Biden continue his enthusiasm for the Indo-Pacific? That is an open question. I am quite certain that Biden too or Biden's successor would continue the warmth towards India. After all, you have seen Prime Minister Modi have this warmth with President Obama, Trump and Biden in succession. So I do not see a problem on the bilateral side. I certainly see a commitment to the Indo-Pacific perhaps coming into question. And also, will the new administration challenge China as they now say they are doing? Or will they start adjusting to China again? I think these are the critical issues ahead of us. Okay. Um, you know, uh, Ambassador uh, Sharma, uh, for a long time, India and the United States were not considered natural alliance partners. Uh, you know, we've had our differences in the past, but over the past several years, we have come closer. Uh, like Ambassador Gurjeet mentioned, uh, you know, former presidents also have shared a warmth 
a certain camaraderie with the Prime Minister Modi. Uh, and over the years, we have seen this kind of proximity and this close tie-up between the two countries. Why do the two countries need each other so much? Well, there is so much uh, which is compatible between the two. There's so much uh, which is mutually uh, nourishing between the two. And uh, there's so much which the U.S. needs today in the neo -geo geopolitical situation where India figures prominently. And there's so much that we need uh, in our own uh, development uh, trajectory where U.S. Uh, can play a very helpful and, uh, uh, and supportive role. So all these factors bring us together. It is irrespective of the third countries. There's so much common. And so that's the reason why, uh, and these 20 years, you know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee first mentioned in 2000, 1999, that India and the U.S. should be national allies. And then that sentiment has continued and has been, uh, you know, successively reinforced and strengthened, as you, discuss, as you mentioned. So... There is so much for us to, to do together. And uh, the fact that uh, Indian successes are now admired in the U.S., India's capacity is admired. The point was made about, uh, you know, other countries uh, supplanting China. But the one major hurdle there is a country with capacity. So if you think of scale and capacity, India is a candidate for that because uh, even Vietnam, which has done very well, it has limited capacity to really come up to fill the void. So it is in this respect that the recent uh, uh, developments in India-U.S. relations and India's own uh, success stories so far, like last quarter's growth, 7.8%, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it suddenly inspires uh, confidence in the interlocutors that, well, they are dealing with a country where things can happen. And so all these things have actually fortuitously or fortunately uh, have led to a crescendo, uh, which is the G20 summit. And I feel that uh, this augurs well for, for, for us. And uh, I think I'm, as in my diplomatic career and otherwise also, I'm an incorrigible optimist. So I always want to look at the positive side. You, whatever negative, let them come and uh, fall. But we should see what is possible and what is, uh, you know, forward-looking. So in that sense, I I, I would place uh, yeah. India-U.S. relationship at a very high, uh, uh, you know, uh, high mark. And um, the 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 talks and, today and between obviously, uh, you know, diplomacy is all about optimistic uh, cautiousness that is practiced. Every day, Ambassador uh, Goyal, um, you know, uh, one of the key points that has come out of this uh, joint statement has also been about tech transfer, technology transfer, uh, whether it's the India-US initiative on critical and emerging technology or the ICET, um, or the kind of uh, tech transfers that we've seen earlier as well between the two countries. Uh, they have, um, you know, taken center stage in the relationship. Mm -hmm. This time around, the two leaders, the two countries have agreed on a 6G tie-up as well. An MOU has been signed between Bharat 6G Alliance and mm -hmm. Next G Alliance. Mm -hmm. Clearly, tech transfer <clears throat> being a key, um, uh, you know, highlight, being a key takeaway from this partnership. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, I would say that if there is one element, one single element, which should be the critical part of relationship between India and the USA would be the tech transfer. Uh, I think the way our economy, our Indian economy, has got, gathered strength over the last uh, more than one decade, three or four decades, uh, say particularly uh, over, uh, since we opened up our economy, it is actually the impediment of the technology that we need, which has come in the way. And the USA is the most important technology partner that India can have. And therefore, if the obstructions, the difficulties which have come in the way of tech transfer, if they can be resolved, that would be the single most important <laughs> achievement of the declaration and the, and the discussions. Uh, for, 
I would also like to underline in this particular aspect. Uh, as we have indicated uh, also by choosing the theme for uh, G20 and also by choosing the various subsets in terms of important areas for uh, G20, the public digital goods or the public digital infrastructure is one most important item on which we need G20 consensus. And if we want to go the way of technology being the backbone of Indian growth, we need the USA in that um, uh, effort. And if, the, if Joe Biden's the president can deliver hats off and all the best, that would be the single most thing, uh, Shreya. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Ambassador Gujit Singh, uh, multilateralism has been a key focus for not just India, but its allies as well. And of course, under G20 presidency, uh, we have talked about multilateralism also. And uh, the U.S. has, in fact, also reiterated and reaffirmed its support for a reformed U.N. Security Council with India as a permanent member. Uh, that is a reiteration of uh, America's past stance. And in this context, uh, they welcomed India's candidature for the UNSC non-permanent seat in 2028-29. Uh, but clearly, you know, for all the talk about multilateralism, we still not, are not at the UNSC as a permanent member. Thank you. The best way forward for what we call reformed multilateralism is to make sure that the G20 is not destroyed. And therefore, it must be protected by middle powers like India and others. As you have seen, the G7 has no compunction in misusing it for political purposes. And China has no problem in using it for their uh, global ascendancy. Now, the UN Security Council is also already rendered useless. So we can't let that happen to the G20. We worked with Europe for multilateralism, but now Europe has become part of US-led unilateralism. So the world is being divided and we need more multipolar world in which India must play a role, but we hope that ASEAN, Africa, Latin America would also play a role. Now, when it comes to supporting India for a permanent seat in the Security Council or for the nuclear supplies group, as Ambassador Goyal pointed out, A, these are not new. B, these are low-cost options because China will never let that happen. So you can keep announcing your support. What does it mean? It is like saying, I'll give you $20 billion for a just energy transition, like at the last G20, the US told Indonesia, nine months down the line, not one dollar has flowed. So how to get away from empty promises and have the big countries stop recycling their promises and put money down when they promise it is our biggest challenge of multilateral. In the joint statement that you are quoting, there is no mention of multilateral development banks. The Americans remain reluctant to reform the World Bank. And they use the fact that China is a very big debtor, which it is, and countries use the IMF to borrow and repay China. Yes, it's happening. I agree. So China is equally responsible for the problems of multilateralism. And yet, both the big powers are the loudest when it says to applaud multilateralism. But they are the ones who are leading the world into big power rivalry and a bipolar world. And that is where India needs to maneuver itself away from them, ensure the success of G20. And if we cannot agree on the paragraphs on Ukraine, that is only a symbol of big power rivalry. On all the other agenda points, I think there will be unanimity ultimately. Thank you. Hmm. Okay. Uh, my last question to you, Ambassador uh, Sharma. Um, 
you know, India-US relationship has been called the defining partnership of the 21st century. Uh, and under India's G20 presidency, like Ambassador Gurjeet Singh said, uh, the success should not be determined by whether there is a declaration or not. It should be seen on the number of issues that have unanimity. Do you agree with that? And how do you see this partnership really moving forward? Well, you know, as I said earlier, the very fact that we've had this summit here and the very fact that we have such a, an impressive attendance at the summit, not only of the members of G20, but also the special invitees which we have uh, you know, brought. Uh, this uh, itself characterizes, uh, uh, you know, a fair measure of success. That uh, the declaration should come out uh, will be will add to it. But uh, personally, I feel that uh, absence of declaration, and I agree with uh, Gurjeet and Suresh also that the absence of a consensus on a declaration should not go against G20. We can, uh, we can live with that. After all, uh, you know, we have been through these multilateral forums earlier and uh, successful multilateral forums also, including multilateral groupings like EU, for instance, they encounter a lack of consensus uh, and recently these present tensions, uh, they are not able to come to a closure on many issues. ASEAN, which is again another very successful yeah. uh, body, it also has uh, now come to uh, grief on many of these things. So in the multilateralism, uh, it's, it's March, you have to go through these, uh, these uh, tight spots, uh, but uh, importance is to manage uh, mm. them and to not to, uh, to sully our optimism. After all, UN also, there are a lot of people who have been announcing the demise of the UN for last uh, de several decades. But UN persists, and uh, despite its failings and shortcomings, it is able to help uh, in many ways. So there is a certain uh, transcendence in, in these groupings where uh, enlightened self-interest of members uh, brings them together. And it is that enlightened self-interest which is uh, the uh, hallmark. And I feel uh, there is ample of that in this uh, yeah. present summit. Uh, so I, I feel uh, we should okay. look forward uh, okay. with hope Let's and Let's hope optimism. we have the New Delhi Declaration. Yeah. Let's, let's hope we have this New Delhi declaration on Sunday. And, uh, you know, just yesterday I was talking to Ambassador Ashok Sajjanhar and I'm going to wrap this up with what he said, that it's going to be a good declaration if everybody is equally unhappy uh, and perfection doesn't exist. Everybody has to be equally unhappy when this declaration comes out. Uh, so let's hope that it does. And when it does, uh, we will, of course, talk more about it. But for now... Uh, I'll have to wrap this discussion up. Uh, Ambassador Suresh Goyal, Ambassador Gurjeet Singh and uh, Sh uh, Ambassador Sharma, thank you very much for joining us on Mirror Now. And I'm glad that uh, India is bringing the world together and we could bring, bring all three friends together today on Mirror Now. Uh, thank you very much for joining us on Mirror Now and sharing your perspective on this uh, extremely crucial partnership between India and the United States. With that, let's... Uh, Slip into a short break. News and updates will continue on the other side on Mirror Now. Stay tuned.